Welcome to the Beyond the Music podcast. My name is Brian, and this is Ian. Hey there. What's up? Beat you. <laughs> you didn't even let me set you up that time. <laughs> on, on today's episode, we're going to spotlight the incredible soundtracks from Naughty Dog's Uncharted series. The Uncharted games have been an incredible achievement in video games, and we're going to break down why the soundtracks have been so impactful. We'll be going over the main games in chronological release order. So Ian, what are your thoughts on the first game? Well, the first game, personally, I didn't. I played the third game first, and when I went back to play the first game, I, I didn't enjoy it as much because it was a bit of a step down from the third as far as gameplay goes. But music-wise, um, not that I was really paying attention to the music the first time, but look, thinking back on it, um, I, don't really, I didn't really notice anything that stood out a whole lot in the original soundtrack. I noticed that, too. When I, when I listened to it, it was very, the music was very background-oriented. And none of the melodies stood out to me. If there were any melodies, it felt it felt like all the music was just for the background, for the sake of the game, not for the stake, for the sake of having the music stand on its own. And then I read an interview with Greg Edmondson, the composer, for the first three games, and he said he specifically wrote the soundtrack to refrain from any melodies to avoid repetition. And I thought, I get that. That's a that's a if you write specifically for that, you know, that works. I just didn't agree with that. Right. Yeah, it is nice to have a lot of melodies. And that's something that a lot of video game composers and people that have written books on video game composition talk about a lot, too. Because you are going to have the issue of you're going to have looping music in a game. So it's different from a movie score, and you don't want it to be irritating. And if you have a melody that stands out too much, you'll, you'll notice it, and you'll notice every single time it loops. So, like, the fallback safety when you're scoring for a game is to score in such a way that it's very ambient, there's not really, it's kind of chord tones, maybe some soundscape type things, which which works well, it kind of sets up a mood, but it doesn't necessarily have any melody in it, and that's the fallback kind of safe thing. And this was um, Greg Edmondson's first actual job composing for a video game, and so I'm sure he was a bit nervous and after reading up on some of the literature on it probably thought maybe that was the safest he mentioned that in an in an interview where he said this was my first game and i wasn't quite sure how to approach it and he said i didn't want to use melodies a lot because when they loop i didn't want the melodies to lose their impact and i can respect that you know i know if this if i was doing uncharted this big sony game i would probably be i would play it more safe and say Let's do a solid soundtrack, maybe refrain from the melodies. So I get where he's coming from. It just doesn't hold up on a re-listen by right. itself. And also, I mean, that, that is an older game, and technology has improved a whole lot, especially in the world of interactive music and what you can do and how easily you can code things into the game. And um, also, you have to have some experience in the game world and know some of the, the ways that you can actually write stuff so that it can be resequenced by the game engine itself or things along those lines. But he did actually do some, he did some actually advanced video game work in it. You were talking about um, like those 30 to 40 minute sections where the music would kind of swell and then come to a stop. Yeah, so, you know, if you're writing for a movie, it's a, it's a set, the scene is set, the picture doesn't change from, you know, you might get a daily, but the movie is the movie. It doesn't change where a video game is dependent on the player and you don't know what the player is going to do so you write 30 to 45 seconds of music instead of three to four minutes of music and then you have that 30 seconds crescendo so the music builds for 30 seconds has a crescendo breaks and then it does it again and if you listen to the track sanctuary off the first soundtrack it's a great example listen to that and you can tell this is where they splice it up right so what that, that is kind of neat how they're doing that. So what he did was he composed like a track and then in post after it was recorded, they kind of cut the track a after those swells and it would kind of die for a second and then come back in. And this is really similar to what they call horizontal resequencing in video games, which is where you have like, like you'll have a section of music and in more advanced versions, the way it would be set up is you'd have a section of music that doesn't necessarily end, but there's like a transition and it can tra transition to different sections. So depending on what the player does, the music will immediately transition so this is a less um this is a less theoretically complex way he just kind of builds it to a crescendo stops and then they start a new cue 
but it, it does a good job of interacting with the player and kind of yeah it makes it makes it more it makes it more interesting so I think that's a neat thing he did outside of you know whereas there weren't a whole lot of melodies in it a lot of it was kind of ambient sort of sounds I think using that type of kind of early horizontal resequencing was was a nice addition to it I think if you'll see it a lot more when we get to the second game with the melodies where they build off of what they did for the first game this one was just a foundational right we're trying something completely new with a more cinematic uh they did a live orchestra they had 60 person orchestra and you know they used a lot of ethnic flutes and conches conch shells and didgeridoos and they they really took their time with it and i you know i appreciate it looking back on it it's not my favorite of the soundtracks but I like it's a good start. I like it. Right. And it was an early game that was trying to do that cinematic type thing. Now, so many games have done that, and the art of scoring music for it and even making games in that style has kind of been perfected more so. So, yeah, looking back, they did a great job with what they had. With, with, now let's get to some of the theory. I noticed he uses a lot of natural minor, Hmm. uh, Aeolian mode, where, where Nate's theme is you can analyze it in E Aeolian. Um, the grave robbing track uses D natural minor. And I, I wonder if that was more, he likes natural minor to, to thread all the, the themes together or if it, if it was more, you know, let's just see what it sounds like. I think a lot of that, that was probably more of evoking a certain type of sound or emotion. I think, cause like something too bright or maybe too consonant and major sounding might not work as well. Um, and also, you know, that it, when it's in that sort of minor, he used a lot of pentatonic type type stuff in there as well, especially in some of the other games. And I think that that's kind of, that, that pentatonic sound sounds a little bit non, it, it's very Western, but it also sounds a little non-Western in some ways. And I think it can kind of evoke that sort of um, kind of adventure sort of feel to it. And also, like, you get more of like an epic feel off of minor generally. So I think that probably one of his, his reason for approaching with with um natural minor was yeah with with natural minor you get you get that minor five mm-hmm. where if you use you know a different minor mode you get the dominant five and that's a very classical if you go five one in a minor it's very classical and, and it can evoke a different sound you might not be going for like you said it's more adventure based and it's not safe but you get you can evoke different mu- uh, moods better if you use a natural minor and you see that grave robbing uses it uh, drake's elegy is uses a f natural minor motif in the beginning then it mixes some modes but you know for the most part it's he uses natural minor throughout the soundtrack all right so next we're going to talk about uncharted 2 and this is almost everyone's favorite uncharted game out of all of them um and also the music stands out a whole lot in this one so what were some things you found when you were researching this game as far as the music goes so the orchestra is up to 80 people compared with 60 people versus the first game and greg edmondson was involved with the story very early on he was getting drafts of the story and you can you can tell the the score is much more involved in the game and the game had a bigger budget everything was made better from the success of the first game. Right. And there was a lot of, um, as far as the music being more interactive with the player and kind of being more advanced techno- technologically. Techno- well, anyways, being more advanced in yeah, general. We go. We yeah, know yeah, what yeah we know what we're saying. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they found, they, they started doing things like, there was a lot of sneaking in this game, more so in the first one. And honestly, there was way more sneaking in this one than there was in the third. Um, but what was neat about it was the music was, was very kind of like almost had the more of like that ambient sound kind of strings kind of low tones and things like that that would play when you were sneaking around and trying to you know take out all these army guys or whatever but then as soon as you got spotted and then everyone started shooting at you the music would kick up and you get more percussion more brass more of a symphonic sound and so that was neat that you started to see the music kind of setting the mood and changing in real time quicker than just those swells even though it did it did use those 30 to 40 second swells like they did in the first one, but this one had some more advanced horizontal sequencing going on. The percussion is, it uses it throughout the Uncharted 2 soundtrack, and you can tell they use that to, instead of having these crescendos and breaks and silence, they would use percussion and drums to 
how do I phrase this, keep everything together to where you can't necessarily tell where the breaks in the music are. So you just have this underlying percussion beat and then you layer on top different strings. So if you're sneaking, you've got the slight percussion. And then as you say, it ramps up, the percussion is added, but you're not taken out of the music by just random swells. It it threads everything together very effectively. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a neat thing to do because rhythmically there's no pitch content or anything, exactly. so you're not like, oh, that's a weird chord transition, yeah. you know? Okay, that's that's a neat way of doing that. Well, also, um, I want to talk some about you know in films you have establishing shots when you get into new areas, and a lot of times there'll be music that supports that to kind of like psychologically get you zoned into where you're supposed to be. Well, this game obviously does a lot of that because there's lots of diverse places you go to, especially when you get into um the Himalayan sort of section. So I wanted to talk some about how he used more native instruments to that area to make make it more effective and make you feel more like you were actually there. Um, what were some of the instruments you found that they were using? Well, they used the iru, that's how you pronounce it. Iru, iru. Yeah, iru. something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a stringed instrument from uh, an Asian stringed instrument. It has a very vocal quality. Listen to the Marco Polo track, Reunion, Among Thieves. It all has that instrument, and it's it stands out so much. It cuts right through the mix, and it's beautiful. It's such a. It's kind of like the equivalent of a violin, but like the Chinese traditional Chinese instrument version of it. It has two strings on it, and it's um. It does. It sounds so beautiful. I remember the first time I heard it was in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I think the track is called Farewell. Um, I thought it was a human voice. It sounded like a high soprano's voice. It was so crisp and clean. Obviously, it, it depends on how skillfully it's played, but um, well, it's we'll a talk about instrument. skill. You brought one in. Uh, you have one. Yeah, I got one. I, I mentioned it to um to a family member, and and they thought it would be cool to get me one. And I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I can't play it. It is so such a difficult instrument. You to brought play. it in, and a group of musicians. We didn't. Know we couldn't figure what, out what to what do. What to do? What? It's. <laughs> It's so strange. There's no frets. It's like there's no frets. It's all suspended strings, and then the bow itself. It is a bowed instrument, but the bow, like the hairs of the bow, are ran between the two strings. Anyways, it's a crazy instrument. Um, one of the things that was really cool that we found and that Brian found some interviews, and I was looking through them as well. Um, that they had this particular earhu player on it, Karen Han, and um, it's really neat because she played on the Star Trek 2009 soundtrack, and that one has um they play a theme on the Irhu that kind of represents the Vulcan planet because it sounds so foreign to everyone here in, in like a Western culture setting. But yeah, he said uh, Edmondson said in an interview that if you hear an Irhu in a soundtrack, it's probably Karen Hahn playing it. She's that great at it. And all you have to do is listen to Uncharted 2. And you're like, oh, that's why she plays everywhere. Because like you say, it sounds like a voice. When I first heard it, I wasn't quite sure what it was. If you said it's a woman's voice synthesized, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what it is, yeah. It's neat. And they even sweetened the sound with it a lot, too, because, like, they would mix it in with the strings. Like, I think it was clearly, it was either recorded individually, like a close mic, or they did it afterwards. But they would record the string section, then she'd play along with the lead, the head, like, the, you know, the highest line or whatever. Um, and it really changed the whole timbre of, like, an entire string section. And I think that leads to... My favorite part about this soundtrack is the use of melodies and motifs throughout. That it's what separates the second one from the first one. The the how they thread melodies together. Uh, like I said, Reunion uses this. Um, it's just so much more effective when you have a a motif that plays throughout the soundtrack that the listener can go, oh yeah, that's that melody playing for this scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like like he you know. Greg Edmondson had way more time to work on this and he was notified ahead of time that they were going to be making this one and so he started writing themes earlier and he started studying you know the those native instruments and like the types of melodies they would write so it's yeah it made for a way more interesting soundtrack to listen to one thing I noticed too compared to with the first game is harmonically uh, the progressions were much more interesting one thing was this technique he uses I don't think it has a name but John Williams does it all all the time if you listen to John Williams music it's when you use minor chords and intervals so you go up you start with F minor go up to G minor you say I'm going to use minor chords and intervals of a third Uh, and 
it's you're not really in a key and it and since all the chords are minor your ear can't pick up on what the tonic key is listen to Hedwig's theme from Harry Potter the beginning it does this you're just these weird minor chords and Bustin' Chops the track uses stuff like that and it's it's so different from the first game where everything was more safe which we said mm-hmm. we get why you, you would yeah, play Yeah, we safe. understand why he did it. But yeah, he, he made a lot more risks in this one and it definitely paid off because it was a super interesting soundtrack. Because th- th- that music really stood out to me, especially the theme Marco Polo that plays um, when Nathan Drake and Ellen were with, uh, oh man. Schaefer. Sh- Schaefer, right, the Tibetan monk guy who, who ended up passing away in that scene. Rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace, <laughs> right. But yeah, that was such a kind of emotional scene in the game and the music underscored it so well and it stood out to me like I bought the track immediately I after I heard it the way again going back to the harmonic the track re- reunion he uses this interplay between the an A flat major and F minor which is the uh, relative minor and there's a simplicity in using triads like that sometimes you know I know myself when you compose it's like oh, I'm going to use all these extended chords and there's just something about using a triad, and that's where that theme comes in. Uh, it gives a weird, you're not quite sure what the tonic is. You know, are we in A flat major or are we in F minor? And Marco Polo uses that. It's just a, a very clever way to write scores. And this was because Nutty Dog actually let Greg Edmondson write longer, more emotional tracks for this particular title. Yeah, he did a lot of research on Chinese and Tibetan music and it it paid off yeah it did lots of really interesting instruments in there too like like the tibetan horns that we were reading about then he was saying that they weren't very um they didn't give like a lot of melodic material but they they made these crazy cool textures yeah i think it's more you just hit it and whatever it does yeah whatever it does you record it and, and there you go well we'll just see what it sounds like and it it really gives that feeling you're in tibet and that um Himalayan right and it played that first time when you see the monastery speaking of like those establishing shots I also noticed that those Tibetan monks go crazy whenever you die did you know do you remember that I remember like I'd fall off and just be like like, whoa what what, what, what is that and that must that must have been those Tibetan horns because it's such a a strange stinger (laughs) it's a good stinger yeah good death stinger (laughs) now we are on to Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception what you got for me all right well um This one was recorded in a different place. The budget obviously kept on growing for these games as they became more and more popular. And they recorded at Abbey Road Studios in London. Do you know the Beatles recorded there? Have you heard of them? I've heard of the Beatles before. (laughs) Yes, I have. Uh, They're an Uh, unknown (laughs) band. Yeah, not many people know about them. They're pretty indie. (laughs) But but this was, um, they they recorded the other two in San Francisco. So this was a big step up coming to like a new studio like that. I know uh, Edmondson mentioned the pressures of writing these scores that they just sapped his time and creativity where he couldn't really do much else other than work on these scores. Yeah, there was definitely a lot going in. I mean, and this is the same as the last one. He had to do a lot of research um, on some Middle Eastern instruments, trying to figure out what would be best for the soundtrack in that case as well. So there was definitely a lot going into this one. I think the difference between Uncharted 3 and the other two is the variety and the locales in this one. This one is all over the globe. I know he used his um, experience on Firefly to help him with this. Right, yeah. Firefly is an interesting show. If you're not familiar with what it is, it's like a like a space sci-fi kind of thing, but it's also like a Western done in space. It's really unique, and, and it has a lot of ethnic instruments in it just to kind of, you know, just to give like evoke a feeling of different planets and of just how strange the concept is of that particular film. You you find it here in Uncharted 3, they go Arabia, they're in London, they're in a chateau in France. Right. It's all over the place. And I you can tell he used his experience from Firefly on here. Yeah, the um the themes for these areas were great especially the theme for the um for the desert shot but that one scene where you get shot out of the plane and like you catch on to that parachute that you know it's just there <laughs> um that's such a great shot of the desert and it's it, visually it's amazing but the music comes right along with it and supports what you're seeing there and it's in it's actually in fifth mode harmonic minor so 
D fifth mode harmonic minor. Anyways, really, <laughs> really cool sound, and it's so bizarre and very unique to like. It, it it really evokes that idea of the Middle East and deserts and things along those lines. One thing, this this isn't my favorite of the soundtracks, but one thing you mentioned the Middle Eastern. As you as you know, Ian, I, I'm from Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. so any Middle Eastern, I gravitate towards that. I always find that music interesting, but it can be cliche very quickly. Like a lot of people, like oh, I'm just going to play harmonic minor over something mm-hmm. and get that cliche sound. He doesn't do that. He uses harmonic minor, like you say. Yeah, but it's fifth mode harmonic minor, which is which is very different, and it sounds it kind of matches more of that. But like you were saying, like like some of the instrumentations and such. Yeah, you. It's just easy to make Middle Eastern music cliche. Mm-hmm. I know they, they have this prominent female vocal. There's there's no lyrics, but she sings this melody, and it, it just works so well for that Middle Eastern style. And I just appreciated that it wasn't this cliche nonsense of we're in Middle Eastern now we're going to play a sitar. You know that that's that kind of thing. It, it just stood out to me. I also think that the use of the main theme in the third game was it was interesting. It was different. I, I don't know that I liked it more, but it, it definitely set up kind of a different feel because the the first two games had the main theme, you know, Nathan Drake's theme played on the French horns and had this sort of heroic sort of sound to it, but this one went with the trumpets, which also has like a heroic sound, but it's like a different tone and kind of setting and such. But wh- how do you feel about some of the other melodic changes in this game compared to the well, last? Well, he borrowed... He borrowed some stuff from the second game. I mentioned that the minor chord interval idea. He uses that in Uncharted 3 as well. Melodically, he does uh, some interesting things. The track I Ram of the Pillars uses this minor second tritone melody. He'll play a minor second melody and then go up a tritone and play the same melody. Very interesting sound. It's really cool. And, and also, like we talked about some of the dynamic, interactive music that they'd been writing for these these games um he really kind of took it to the next level with this with the third installment it was um it was interesting because you would have sometimes half the mix would drop out and you would just hear the strings that would be playing and then uh, other instruments could come in and out and this is like this is what they would call like vertical layering in a lot of these you know method and theory books on video game music but it, it's really interesting to see how they started incorporating some of these more advanced he interactive inter- music ideas he had an interview where he discussed that he said you know, in order to stretch music to cover the whole game, sometimes the music gets deconstructed. So they'll only play the low strings and, until the player does something, and then the brass comes in. And you mentioned, you know, uh, layering. That's how they do it. So you you have all the instruments, and then you separate them and just have them loop and play until the player triggers the cutscene, gets past a certain point, and then they bring all the instruments back in. Right, and that's a neat thing that kind of plays off the first game and shows how much he learned too, because you can have, you can have your track playing all of this this full orchestral thing that has no melody over it, but there's actually a melody written in like the trumpet line, for example, but it only comes in at certain points and it can fade in and out or it can break down. It's really neat what you can do. You know, I mean, you can take you can take a ten second loop of music, and if you put vertical layering on it, you could draw that out for many many minutes without it being noticed or even getting boring and such a lot of times in that game you'll have a section where you you can walk around by yourself and explore and then there'll be a section where you're on a car and you're driving through the canyon and you're you're on a track with the game that's where this layering can come in handy to where you have the low strings like you say without the melody then you get to the point where you're on a track and you play the melody with everything and it gives us full sound all right next we're going to go on to uncharted 4 a thief's end so what were some things right out of the gate you noticed that were different about this one brian Hmm. well one big thing i did notice is that it's a new composer and it was henry jackman much like edmondson in uncharted 1 this was his first work in video games and they had a, a major production change at naughty dog a lot of the higher ups uh, left, and they they hire new people, so they went with a new direction for the soundtrack. And Henry Jackman, he worked with Hans Zimmer on Dark Knight. He was um, he just helped out with that score. He worked with John Powell on Kung Fu Panda, 
And he also had an electronic background before he got into composing. The Winter Soldier soundtrack is a perfect example of right of mixing mixing those electronic and kind of acoustic orchestral stuff. It's not it's not prevalent in this in the Uncharted Four soundtrack. The the score those who prove worthy has hints of that where where you see oh that's that's his electronic background mm-hmm. come through. Yeah, it, it's the production like you said it's so much crisper and cleaner. Um, on this one because we were even talking about the other ones where even though they were recorded with you know decent sized orchestras if someone mentioned that it was MIDI you might be like eh, maybe maybe it was but this one like it sounds so good it's so cinematic too you can definitely hear that influence from composers like Hans Zimmer and such and like even the strings are constantly running like like they act more rhythmically and there's just a lot of droning so like it'll sit on one chord for a long time and, and then, you know, play something over that. It's really neat how, how it was designed. Definitely different from the past games. The, but di- I, the dynamic range in the strings is absolutely incredible. It, you feel like you're at a live symphony when you listen to this stuff. The melodic use in this is really great, too. There's lots of uses of Nate's theme and using it in different ways, too. Like, even that little, that short intro of one of the first tracks on it, where it does that droning thing, but you hear... You hear um, Nate's theme used, played differently, you know, it's playing over. And they do this purposely because the whole story with Nate is that he's beyond his past life. And so they sprinkle his old melodies throughout this new soundtrack to hint that there's still something there. Right. Now, I haven't I haven't actually played through this game yet. Um, but tell me, tell me, towards the end, does it like bring his theme back in full? That's actually one of my favorite parts in the score is there's never... Nate's theme doesn't come back in one track. What he does is he brings fragments of Nate's theme as climaxes in end tracks. So, for example, the score Brothers Keeper finishes with a cue from Nate's theme, and it's used in the entire last quarter of the score. And it's it's a great way to say he's on to something new, but they're still part of his past. And it, it's it's just such it's so effective. Yeah, and also, let's talk about some about the instrumentation in this one. Um, we, we were talking before, and we kind of came to the conclusion that this one didn't use as many ethnic instruments as some of the past uh, soundtracks did. And it actually had a lot of piano and guitar in it. Yeah, there's more, there's more classical guitar, there's more acoustic riffs. I don't want to say riffs because it sounds like it's a metal band or something. Right, but, yeah. But, but there's just more uh, acoustic guitars and pianos that will play a theme lightly where you hardly ever saw that in the first three soundtracks. Hmm. Yeah. And also, the um, just to kind of wrap up what we've been talking about with the other games, the the music was like the interactiveness of the music and the kind of technology is definitely a different approach. Um, we were talking, there's another thing in video game music called stingers, which are these short little musical phrases you'll hear. Like a really popular stinger would be when Mario falls off of a map. You'll hear like this little melody that tells you oh you just died right um and it was used in this game too but in a bit of a different way you start to hear it more in the form of a uh it kind of use it's used to give hints so like we were we were just watching a scene there's a there's a great scholar (laughs) on um video game music and design and such who who's from berkeley school of music his name is michael sweet he wrote a book called writing interactive music for video games it's a fantastic book but he wrote a um a blog a while ago that was talking about multiple different forms and he was talking about stingers and how they were particularly used in uncharted 4 and um it's really neat because like it showed a clip of he was exploring these different artifacts and whenever he walked up to one you'd hear like this this distant flute melody and he'd walk to another one and you it would like continue the phrase and it was like cued by the player pressing triangle to look at the thing right and then the music added more instruments in it was really interesting there's that's clever because it doesn't start until the player initiates it. So you you don't have to worry about mm, maybe they won't walk here or whatever. The player starts it by pressing triangle. And the length of the phrase, they wrote it to where it's just about the amount of time it takes to walk to the next part. Right, so you, you would look at one artifact, walk to the next one, and it would continue the phrase. Really, really interesting design. And that's really 
like the essence of what a stinger is. It's a short phrase that is only plays when the player does something. It could be something like dying that would be like involuntary, but also pressing a button or picking something up, something along those lines. And you can hint at at future story elements by you know I, I think that the final phrase or final stinger when you look at the city there's like this dissonant interval to hint at what's to come it's very effective yeah yeah that's right because it was kind of like setting up some things that you might be seeing later on and so, seeing as how there's such short fragmented phrases that uh works really effectively all right ian we've gone through all the games all the major releases except for the one that came out for ps vita or whatever but we're not going to talk about that so anyways continue <laughs> <laughs> the Vita is actually a really great side note. Okay. <laughs> I haven't it's I haven't played fantastic. it. Fantastic. It's so good. But that's another that's another For another discussion. time. Yes. What is your favorite soundtrack of the four? So of the four um I, honestly one of the scenes that stood out to me most was that shot of the desert in the third one. That I really remember that quite vividly. Just because that was such a great scene. That might be one of my favorite cues like in-game cues, but my favorite soundtrack was Uncharted 2. The main theme in Uncharted 2 was my favorite. Um, I really, really enjoyed all the other music in it, and I thought overall it had a better soundtrack than the others. 2 is my favorite as well. Other The other soundtracks have elements like the third one. It's There's so much variety. It feels... it's it, it, The soundtrack already tells a story because it's about a video game. But it feels like a mini concept album because it goes from place to place and it's very interesting to listen to. Yeah, you get a lots of different varieties depending on... Yeah, like you were saying, it's almost like there's like little mini episodes within the overall game. So yeah, there is lots of great music in it. and it, it has It's very diverse, but I think that the music in the second one was just fantastic. It's, I always gravitate towards soundtracks with melodic themes and it's the second one has it throughout. Um, the fourth would be my second favorite it's just so cinematic I, right I, I love the cinematic elements of it um yeah I, I do like the fourth and, and the way it like used Drake, drake's theme in different ways um and kind of hit it back in the mix i thought that was so clever and interesting to listen. and it's so exciting when you hear it and that's something the other games didn't really capitalize on was having that sort of fanfare yeah main theme i know a lot of people were bummed that edmondson was not the composer for the fourth one I think the game benefited for having a, a, a fresh take on it just because it allowed Henry Jackman to put his own spin on it, but also call back to the work Edmondson had done, which fit into the game very well. Right. And like you were saying, with the whole overarching plot line to it, I think it did a good job of wrapping it up. All right, Ian, we did it. We talked about all four games. We did. You got some YouTube channel promotion. Yes, I do. So my channel is just called Ian O'Donnell, and on there... Can you spell that for us? Yes, I-A-N, and then O'Donnell is O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L. Is there any apostrophes in there? There's an apostrophe between the O and the D, but, mm. you know, YouTube won't recognize it anyways. <laughs> so, Well, maybe one day. Maybe one day. We'll see. My <laughs> channel is Orchestra Studio, O-R-C-A-S-T-R-A, like the Killer Whale Orca. <laughs>